Hi folks, Mark Emery here with the Lighthouse Law Club. This is perhaps one of the most important videos I will ever do because it affects nearly every one of us. It affects us in our daily lives as it is right now. Understanding what's going on in the financial industry will show you how we all have been affected and our lives have been limited by the false weights and measures that have been imposed upon us basically through our ignorance and uh, by virtue of this video uh, hopefully we can lift that veil of ignorance from our eyes where we can see clearly understand exactly what the issues and the problems are and have been and will continue to be unless or until we do something about it so I'm going to do two things in this video. Number one, I'm going to expose bank fraud. I'm going to show you how every loan in America is fraudulent. And I will prove it to you beyond a shadow of a doubt. Secondly, I'm going to show you what we can do about it. We're going to provide a solution. We're going to show you what we can do to eliminate debt in all of its forms in terms of bank loans, credits, credit cards, all the usury that goes on. It's absolutely horrendous what's being done to people in these false weights and measures systems. Okay, So we can eliminate debt in most cases without ever going to court. There will be some of these belligerent, ignorant defendants that really don't know what their own good is and they will proceed to want to go into court and exposed to the world in, a, in not only the court of public opinion, but the court of public record, what their crimes are. And that's to their detriment, not yours. <laughs> okay, now, I first learned about this back in the 90s. I was working, I had a radio show, and I had a guest, uh, his name was Tom Schaff. He had joined me on a number of shows. Tom, many of you uh, uh, may remember, was a CPA. And uh, not only was he an active practicing CPA, but he was an educator. He was teaching other CPAs in classes um, the courses required for them to do their continuing education requirements to maintain their licenses. All right, so he was a super CPA and an educator. And more than that, he was a certified expert witness used in the courts to do forensic auditing and bring his expertise to the courtroom to provide information as an expert witness. And he had done that in dozens of cases. All right, so this guy knew his stuff. And he had discovered the fraud in a discussion he had with a bank auditor. And he went through kind of a, a line of questioning with this bank auditor. And I'm going to give you the gist of that here today. And he got the bank auditor to agree that, yes, bank loans were essentially fraud. All right? So let me prove this to you. How I'm going to do that, I'm going to do a role play situation of an actual courtroom transcript. Listen carefully to the line of questioning and to the answers. Okay? This is an attorney for a borrower questioning the banker who's on the witness stand who made the loan. All right? So... Here's how it goes. Let's take a listen. Let's see if the light bulb goes on for you. And then we'll deal with the remedy. All right, here we go. Okay, Mr. Banker, so what is Court Exhibit A? Well, this is a promissory note. Is there an agreement between Mr. Smith, the borrower, and the defendant? Yes. Do you believe the agreement includes a lender and a borrower. Borrower. Yes, I'm the lender, and Mr. Smith is the borrower. What do you believe the agreement is? We have the borrower sign the note, and we give the borrower a check. 
Does this agreement show the words borrower, lender, loan, interest, credit, or money within the agreement? Sure it does. According to your knowledge, who was to loan what to whom according to the written agreement? The lender loaned the borrower a $200,000 check. The borrower got the money and the house and has not repaid the money. Do you believe an ordinary person can use ordinary terms and understand this written agreement? Yes. Okay. Do you believe you or your company legally own the promissory note and have the right to enforce payment from the borrower? Absolutely we own it and legally have the right to collect the money. Does the $200,000 note have actual cash value of $200,000? Actual cash value means the promissory note can be sold for $200,000 cash in the ordinary course of business. Yes. So according to your understanding of the alleged agreement, how much actual cash value must the bank loan to the borrower in order for the bank to legally fulfill the agreement and legally own the promissory note? $200,000. Okay, so according to your belief, if the borrower signs the promissory note and the bank refuses to loan the borrower $200,000 actual cash value, would the bank or the borrower own the promissory note? Well, the borrower would own it if the bank did not loan the money. The bank gave the borrower a check, and that is how the borrower financed the purchase of the house. Okay. Do you believe that the borrower agreed to provide the bank with $200,000 of actual cash value, which was then used to fund the $200,000 bank loan check back to the same borrower and then agreed to pay the bank back $200,000 plus interest? No, if the borrower provided the 200000 to fund the check, there was no money loaned by the bank, so the bank could not charge interest on money it never loaned. Okay, so if this happened, in your opinion, would the bank legally own the promissory note and be able to force Mr. Smith to pay the bank interest and principal payments? Oh, I'm not a lawyer, so I cannot answer legal questions. Well then, is it bank policy that when a borrower receives a $200,000 bank loan, the bank receives $200,000 actual cash value from the borrower, that this gives value to a $200,000 bank loan check, and this check is returned to the borrower as a bank loan, which the borrower must repay. Well, I do not know the bookkeeping entries. I'm asking you if this is the policy. Well, I do not recall. Okay. Mr. Banker, do you believe the agreement between Mr. Smith and the bank is that Mr. Smith provides the bank with an actual cash value of $200,000 which is used to fund a $200,000 bank loan check back to himself, which he is then required to repay plus interest back to the same bank? Well, I am not a lawyer. Did you not say earlier that an ordinary person can use ordinary terms and understand this written agreement? Yes. Okay. Okay, Mr. Banker, I'm going to hand you back the bank loan agreement. This is Exhibit B. Is there anything in this agreement showing the borrower had knowledge or showing where the borrower gave the bank authorization or permission for the bank to receive $200,000 actual cash value from him in the note and to use this to fund the $200,000 bank loan check, 
which obligates him to give the bank back $200,000 plus interest. No, there is not. Okay, so if the borrower provided the bank with actual cash value of $200,000 in the note, which the bank used to fund the $200,000 check and returned the check back to the alleged borrower as a bank loan check, in your opinion, did the bank loan $200,000 to the borrower? In that case, no. So if a bank customer provides actual cash value of $200,000 to the bank and the bank returns $200,000 actual cash value back to the same customer, is this a swap or exchange of $200,000 for $200,000? Yes. Okay, so did the agreement call for an exchange? or swap of $200,000 to be swapped out for another $200,000, or did it call for a $200,000 loan? A $200,000 loan. Good, so is the bank to follow the Federal Reserve Bank policies and procedures when banks grant loans? Yes. So what are the standard bank bookkeeping entries for granting loans according to the Federal Reserve Bank policies and procedures. And I'll hand you now the Banker Fed publication entitled Modern Money Mechanics, labeled Exhibit C. The promissory note is recorded as a bank asset and a new matching deposit or liability is created. Then we issue a check from the new deposit back to the borrower. So then is this not a swap or exchange of $200,000 for $200,000? Well, this is the standard way we do it. Answer the question. Is it a swap or exchange of 200,000 actual cash value for 200,000 actual cash value? If the note funded the check, must they not both have equal value? Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to plead the Fifth Amendment on this. Okay. Tell me, if the bank's deposits or liabilities increase, do the bank's assets increase by an asset that has actual cash value? Yes. Is there any exception? Not that I know of. So if the bank records a new deposit and records an asset on the bank's books having actual cash value, would the actual cash value always come from a customer of the bank or an investor or a lender to the bank? Yes. All right. Is it the bank policy to record the promissory note as a bank asset offset by a new liability? Yes, it is. Does the promissory note have actual cash value equal to the amount of the bank loan check? Yes. Then, does this bookkeeping entry prove that the borrower provided actual cash value to fund the bank loan check? Well, yes, it does. The bank president told us to do it this way. All right. How much actual cash value did the bank loan to obtain the promissory note? Nothing. Then how much actual cash value did the bank receive from the borrower? $200,000. So then is it true you received $200,000 actual cash value from the borrower plus monthly payments and then you foreclosed and never invested one cent of legal tender or other depositors' money to obtain the promissory note in the first place. Is it true that the borrower financed the whole transaction? Yes. Are you telling me the borrower agreed to give the bank $200,000 actual cash value for free and that the banker returned the actual cash value back to the same person as a bank loan? 
I was not there when the borrower agreed to the loan. Do the standard Fed publications show the bank receives actual cash value from the borrower for free and that the bank returns it back to the borrower as a bank loan? Yes. Okay. Do you believe the bank does this without the borrower's knowledge or written permission and authorization? No. To the best of your knowledge, is there written permission or authorization for the bank to transfer $200,000 of actual cash value from the borrower to the bank and for the bank to keep it for free? No. Does this allow the bank to use this $200,000 actual cash value to fund the $200,000 bank loan check back to the same borrower forcing the borrower to pay the bank $200,000 plus interest. Yes. Then if the bank transferred $200,000 actual cash value from the borrower to the bank, in this part of the transaction, did the bank loan anything of value to the borrower? No. Is it the bank policy to first transfer the actual cash value from the alleged borrower to the lender for the amount of the alleged loan? Yes, it is. Does the bank pay IRS tax on the actual cash value transferred from the alleged borrower to the bank as income? No, because the actual cash value transferred shows up like a loan from the borrower to the bank or a deposit, which is the same thing, so it's not taxable. If a loan is forgiven, is it taxable? Yes, it is. Is it the bank policy to not return the actual cash value that they received from the alleged borrower unless it is returned as a loan from the bank to the alleged borrower? Yes. You never pay taxes on the actual cash value you receive from the alleged borrower and keep it as bank's property? No. No taxes paid. When the lender receives the actual cash value from the alleged borrower, does the bank claim that it then owns it and that it is the property of the lender without the bank loaning or risking one cent of legal tender or other depositors' money? Yes. Are you telling me the bank policy is that the bank owns the promissory note, which is the actual cash value, without loaning one cent of other depositors' money or legal tender, that the alleged borrower is the one who provided the funds deposited to fund the bank loan check and that the bank gets funds from the alleged borrower for free? Is the money then returned back to the same person as a loan, which the alleged borrower repays when the bank never came up with any of its own money to obtain the promissory note? Am I hearing this right? I give you the equivalent of $200,000. You return the funds back to me, and I have to repay you $200,000 plus interest. Do you think I'm stupid? All the banks are doing this. Congress allows this. Does Congress allow the banks to breach written agreements, use false and misleading advertising, act without written permission, authorization, and without the alleged borrower's knowledge to transfer actual cash value from the alleged borrower to the bank and then return it back as a loan? But the borrower got a check in the house. Is it true the actual cash value that was used to fund the bank loan check came directly from the borrower and that the bank received the funds from the alleged borrower for free? This is true. Is it the bank's policy to transfer actual cash value from the alleged borrower to the bank and then keep the funds as the bank's property, which they then loan out as bank loans as if they actually owned it and loaned their own money? Yes. Was it the bank's intent 
to receive actual cash value from the borrower and return the value of the funds back to the borrower as a loan? Yes. Do you believe that it was the borrower's intent to fund his own bank loan check? I was not there at the time, and I cannot know what went through the borrower's mind. So if a lender loaned a borrower $10,000 and the borrower refused to repay the money, do you believe the lender is damaged? If a loan is not repaid, the lender is damaged. So is it the bank policy to take actual cash value from the borrower, use it to fund the bank loan check, and never return the actual cash value to the borrower? The bank returns the funds. Was the actual cash value the bank received from the alleged borrower returned as a return of the money the bank took, or was it returned as a bank loan to the borrower? As a loan. So how did the bank get the borrower's money for free? That's how it works. No more questions, Your Honor. All right, so there you have it. I think we've beaten that dead horse quite sufficiently and uh, the fraud should now be crystal clear. Let's talk about solutions. All right, the solutions naturally involve the law. We're going to involve the use of the uh, Truth in Lending Act, the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. We may very well use uh, Title 18 of the U.S. Code. Uh, federal criminal statutes in uh, racketeering, extortion, and uh, the RICO Act. We can certainly and always will use the Uniform Commercial Code uh, dealing with issues relating to who is the holder in due course of the valid instrument. In other words, who has the valid claim. And so what we're going to do in resolving these uh, debts for you is we're going to start using a series of presentments. You can say it's in the form of a letter. A presentment is a legal document that essentially is going to frame the facts. And we're not going to argue with the folks that uh, are demanding payment. Uh, we're not going to argue at all. We're going to say, okay, we're going to offer to pay in full. If you say we owe the debt, we will pay in full. And this is my bona fide valid offer to pay in full in money of account of the United States. All right. Why do we say that? Because if you don't have the cash check or money order to pay the balances in full right off hand, then your offer would basically be null and void and that would be fraud. Okay. So we've got to be careful how we couch this. Money of account of the United States um, is another thing altogether. And there is plenty of that around to use. All right. So we'll get into that in some of the educational aspects of our program. But our offer is conditional. It's an offer to pay in full, conditional upon them providing evidentiary documentation on six or seven items that would indicate that they do in fact have a valid commercial instrument, negotiable instrument, that they have in fact made a loan. Okay? So they're either going to provide the points that we demand which we know they can't, that's why we're asking for them. Or, in the alternative, they will agree with us for the record that they didn't make a valid loan. And so you say, well, how are we going to get them to agree on the record? Well, it's very simple. It's very simple. They will either provide the evidence we demand within a specified time frame, or they will agree with our averments in the presentment by their silence. In law, silence is consent. And failure to object when you have the opportunity to object is fatal. Okay? So we will know in a very short time what their position is. Either they made a valid loan, which we know they haven't, uh, or they will agree on the record that they did not. And so when that happens, we move to the next step where we will rescind the note, the original note, for failure to perform. Okay? There was an agreement that they were going to loan us funds 
we understood that they had funds to loan us and they didn't. They never did. They loaned us our own funds. That's a bait and switch. So they failed to perform on the agreement so the note is null and void. It was fraudulently induced on false premises. So we rescind the note, that becomes a matter of record and now there's nothing for anybody to stand on. Okay? They will need to zero balance the accounts and report that to the credit bureaus. All right. If they don't, they become liable for damages. And that's not an area that they likely want to go. All right, so you say, well, what if they don't? If they don't, we've got plan B and plan C and plan D. All right, the pain, the heat, and the damages just get ratcheted up on their side. And that's not something they want. Not to mention the public exposure which also comes with failure to perform. So you can certainly imagine how Wells Fargo Bank and Bank of America and Countrywide would love to have, uh, have this all over YouTube, <laughs> dealing with their particular clients, all right? So we've got several fallback positions uh, available if in fact they don't have the common sense to take care of the matter properly in accordance with the law. So now, so how do we get started? First thing is you need to be a member of the Lighthouse Law Club. The training, education, the support that's available will be critical for you and uh, this is necessary. All right, so you need to be a member. You need to join. Join as a member of the Lighthouse Law Club. That's number one. Number two, you can request this uh, Beat the Bankers module and we'll get started on this right away for you. Okay, in the meantime, you can be learning a lot of tremendously valuable and exciting uh, strategies on how to free yourself from the system entirely, not just debts, but traffic tickets, taxes, uh, compelled performance requirements, you know, the whole, whole ball of wax. That's a whole nother story. All right, now, now my experience dealing on the money issue goes back a number of years. Um, I have chronicled many of my adventures in, uh, in my first book entitled One Free Man's War and the Second American Revolution. I had been involved with a group that was filing commercial liens against public officials who were errant in their oath of office and causing damages against the people. They were depositing those commercial liens in their local bank. All right. And uh, we talked in this case about the note being deposited. Well, these guys were depositing commercial liens and they had developed securitized negotiable instruments, uh, a securitized interest in these commercial liens, which the banker accepted as a deposit to open a new checking account. And so these guys were writing checks against the liens they were filing against public officials. Uh, that's a whole story that I won't get into now, but the book gets into it. and. Uh, uh, they ultimately were dealing directly with the Fed and the Department of the Treasury to clear those checks. Um, I have experience dealing in money of account of the United States and uh, developing private commercial instruments uh, for the purpose of uh, discharging debt and was able to acquire a nice shiny signal red Mercedes uh, using that process some time ago. So, um, so I've got quite a bit of experience dealing in this, and uh, I just want you to know that, to have an understanding that, you know, you're not dealing with some guy just, uh, you know, fresh off of a YouTube video, uh, thinks he knows something. Um, so if you'd like to uh, uh, have a little uh, fun, entertain yourself, and learn a few things, uh, you can certainly uh, get a hold of my book, and that'll keep you entertained and informed for a little while. But uh, join the Law Club. You know what to do. And let's take, let's take this country back and get, get everybody out of debt. Now, let me just sign off with a message to the bankers, all right? Listen up, bankers. Um, the gig is up. Your fraud is exposed. The best thing you can do is cooperate with these folks when they come along. Because if you resist, it's only going to get very ugly for you. You know, the paradigm is shifting. The global reset is upon us very soon. You're on your way out with your fraudulent system. Let's face it. You know, the gig is up and uh, you need to decide what side are you on? Are you going to try to help the people, try and make amends for the, for the damage you have done, or are you going to continue 
to dig yourself deeper into the hole that you're in and make it very ugly for yourselves, okay? Um, we're going to give you a chance to get out of this lightly. If not, it's going to get ugly for you, all right? The people are on the rise. All right, folks, that's it. Take care, God bless, and have a good night.